We are live, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Toe the Line with me, George Glinski. Delighted today to be joined by John Collier, who fights Luca Zebek on September the 3rd at BKB28. How are we doing, John? I'm not so bad, mate. How are you? Thanks for having me on the channel eventually. I've, uh, I've mired you enough to get me on, so I appreciate being on. Thank you very much. No, we had to. Of course we had to, of course. Um, I mean, you've... You've already been involved in BKB for a little bit of time. You've been training Dan McGraffin, so a different change of position now with your, your BKB career. You've gone from a trainer to yep. a fighter. Um, yes. So what can we expect from you? There's not too much online. I know you had a, a long and illustrious unlicensed career for Will Kens a few times. Um, what can I you did. tell about you? Hello, and Will. Um, with regards to the style of the fighting or with regards to my background, what do you want to know? You tell me. Your let's start off with your style and then we'll talk a bit about your background. I like to think I'm quite adaptable with my style. I don't, I know it's the age old cliche thing to say, but I can stand and fight or I can box and move. And, and I know that's a dead cliche thing to say, but I genuinely can. I can, I can use my feet if I need to, or I can stay inside. But let's be realistic with burnacle boxing, you don't want to be inside. <laughs> you, you don't, you know, with, with with glove boxing, you've got the big four, you know, gloves that you can tuck up over your face. With burnacle boxing, you've got that. Do you know what I mean? You don't want to be inside. So the preferable uh, method of boxing, a method of attack would obviously box and move. Mm. It doesn't always work like that. Sometimes you get dragged into a war and man pride takes over. But that's my style. I like to think I can do a bit of both. I like to think. Definitely. And did you have an amateur career before you went into unlicensed or was it just purely an unlicensed career? I had one amateur fight. I only had one amateur fight. It was, um, it just didn't appeal to me, the scene. I mean, I've been boxing on and off since I was about 12, but I preferred the unlicensed scene more, maybe because it was a bit more, a bit more relaxed, a bit less authoritative. Do you know what I mean? A bit less regimented. I like the unlicensed, because... With the amateur scene, you don't tend to make friends. Does that make sense? It's like, right, you're in, you've got to put your gum shield on at this point. You've got to, your gum shield's got to be this color. Your wraps have to be this brand. I was like, ah, oh, it's, it's not for me, this. It's not, it's too uniform for me. I just kind of want to turn, train hard, turn up, have a scrap with the lads and then we'll all have a pint afterwards. Do you know what I mean? It's, that that was how I like to look at things. So I just, I just stayed in it. Because I did the unlicensed and then I thought, I'm going to go to the amateurs just to say I'd done it really and they had one at, um, at a sports centre in Earlham uh, by Warrington and after that I just came back to unlicensed I got offered a fight that I couldn't turn down so with James Iggy you remember mm -hmm. James Iggy yeah yeah. that was a good fight James beat me beat me fair and square I'm man enough to admit that good boxer though very good boxer You've obviously boxed some some really good guys. We mentioned the the Will Cairns fights. How many times did you did you fight Will in the end? Five. I fought that ugly little man five times. Uh, he beat me, then I beat him, then we've had three draws on the bounce. So, so I think I think we need to put that to bed. We're just as good as each other, and that's how it is. <laughs> in bare knuckle, that would be an interesting one. Obviously, he's I think he's had 20 plus fights now. He's one of the most experienced guys on the circuit. That would that would definitely be there. He is, it would it, it, it potentially be in the pipeline, I suppose. I'm not going to say no to it, but just see what happens down the line. Will's one of them guys who, um, Will, can he get to London in the next 24 minutes? You know? <laughs> <laughs> He nips into his back pocket and pulls out his supersonic teleporter. And he just just arrives at shows, show savers we call them on the unlicensed circuit. He's a good guy. He's a good guy. He's one of my longest friends in boxing, Definitely. but I still punch him in the mouth if I have to. <laughs> <laughs> so talk to me a little bit about this transition. Obviously, you you're training Dan McGraffin. I'm not sure exactly when. Yeah. You started, I believe, and this is off the top of my head, I believe you started training him from the David Round fight. Is that correct? Sort of. So he came, he did at our gym, Majestic Gym in Pemberton, Wigan. He did um he did the ultra white collar boxing, which is 60 nerds gloves, head guards, train for charity. That's where I first ever met him. Sorry, mate. Bang it on the table aggressively. That's where I because of Dan McGraffin, that's how much he winds me up. Um, <laughs> um that's where I first ever met Dan. Um he came and did that and then he disappeared to Blackpool. His like personal life dictated that he moved up there, yeah. and then it was during COVID, socially distance 
coaching, obviously. Sure. But it was a, uh, it was, it was during COVID. He got in touch and he said he was meant to fight on um, Ragnarok in Norway. Yeah, Norway. Yeah. He was booked in for that, and he said, "Listen, I know you're not going to be able to come to Norway. You've got kids and stuff." He said, "But will you train me?" And I've got a corner team over there, and I said, "Yeah." And then that didn't come off, and then the Ben Pickles fight came to pass when he was signed with the uh, different organisation. Yeah. So. Um, I trained him for that and then I trained him for David Brown and obviously I trained him when he boxed the gentleman that is Daniel Lerwell oh. so, so Rich, you've been training him since well the very start you you would have been very like... 20 I think he, I, I want to say 2014 he came but that that was in group training sessions yeah so yeah. it's like it was just down in the group then no he's one of my best friends and yeah. you know he is he is my fighter now, do you know what I mean? But at the time when we first met, but like I said, he fired off up to Blackpool then. He's um his personal life dictated, that's where he went up to with his girlfriend and whatnot. So but um yeah, he's back now doing my boxing on a daily basis with his five minute voice notes. <laughs> he always does it when you're watching some <laughs> Dan McGrath has sent you a voice note five minutes and twenty seconds long, you're like, come on, Dan. <laughs> Saturday night at seven o'clock, mate. Do you know what I mean? Because it's not a wait until Monday. <laughs> I I know the pain. I know the pain. Although I will say that me and Dad have had three, four hour phone calls, so it's just as much my fault to be honest with you. But he's, yeah, I can imagine. He sent me a screenshot of one of yours. Actually, I think you've been on about two hours and fifteen minutes. I'm like we're grown men. We don't talk for that long. <laughs> Hello, mate. Where are you? I'm at home. Right, turn on it, Brown. Right, see you in a bit, mate. That is a male phone call. <laughs> It should be. It should be a male phone call. It yeah. should be, yeah. It should be. It should be. But um, yeah. So you've obviously watched him from the sidelines. So what was it about that that made you want to get involved? Obviously, you you've been in the corner for what, three bare knuckle fights. I think his first fight was against Ledbetter. What was it about watching that that gave you that that drive to get back in the ring? I think it was the event. It was the like the size of the event and the um, enormity of it all. I kind of. I don't. I don't want to sound too arrogant or like condescending, but I felt like after what I'd done in unlicensed, it kind of tapered off, and I didn't get like a a grand finale. Do you know what I mean? When I retired in February twenty twenty, I boxed really well. I boxed a tough lad. I boxed really well. Won it on points, nice and comfortably. And I thought that's when I was done. But then I went to the event, and I thought I've put twenty years into this sport. Do you know what I mean? Let's just. Let's have a go at this this level. Do you know what I mean? Just just see how good I am. Mm-hmm. Thirty seven now, George. I might get in there and get old overnight, mate. You never know. But I feel good in training. I feel good in everything. But I just I just wanted to I, I just wanted to have a go on that scale. Mm-hmm. Not trying to be a superstar or anything. Do you know what I mean? I'm not arrogant enough to think um, Hall of BKB are going to be astounded by my three round performance on third September. But mm-hmm. for me. I just want to say I've done it. Do you know what I mean? I, I boxed at the O2. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's a pretty Which great is great. Game. Which will be great, should I say? Yeah. Definitely, definitely. But, um, Talking about Luca, uh, sorry to cut you out there, but Luca, we sorry? don't know too much about him. He's under Marco Martin Jack, who's a, a former cruiserweight champion in BKB, a big yeah. time, you know, one of the, the all time uh, greats of, of the sport. But okay. we don't know too much about him. He's obviously from Croatia. He's sort of a kickboxing background. Yeah. Have you seen any footage? What What can you expect from this guy? I've seen a little 40 second, second clip of him hitting the pads with Marco. A lot of respect for Marco. He's a good fighter in his day. I think he's, um, is he retired now? He's retired now, yeah. He's retired, yeah. Good coach. Luca looked all right in the pads. Looks like he's going to be a good fight. Looks like it's going to be a competitive fight, which is what I want, George. Mm. I don't want Jim and Joel to look at, not suggesting to look after anyone, but I don't want them to look after me because I'm Dan's coach and mm. I'm coming down and, oh, he's coming down, he's bigging up our organisation. Mm. Give me a fight. I want a fight, you know what I mean? Because you don't learn anything by knocking someone over who's just there for a quick three, four hundred quid. You don't learn nothing by then. You don't learn anything about yourself either in them fights. Because I know you're... Yeah. A- I know you're a massive tactician in, in that sense. So is it frustrating not being able to see that footage that you would require? Um, not really, because my experience will help me adapt. Mm. You know, we've we've prepared for everything in the gym. And I know, again, I'm going down the cliche route of the boxing interview. But we have prepared for everything in the gym. We've done southpaw pads, orthodox pads. We've done 
somebody's going to stand and bang with me, we've done. Somebody's going to try and catch me on the way in. Somebody's going to come forward and push me backwards. So he's poor sparring, orthodox sparring, switch hitting sparring. Mm-hmm. We, uh, because I work at a predominantly Thai boxing gym. Yeah. So there's loads of Eastern European kickboxers in there. Mm. So I've kind of got an, a little bit of what they're going to... Because the Eastern European style is very standard. You've got like your Golovkin and your better BF. It's very stand up, bang, bang, one, two, nice, long, straight stuff. Mm. So you you kind of... I don't know that sounds a bit stereotypical. I apologise, but that's the Eastern European style. It's, it's a plot forward, one, two, three, nice, nice hook and then move off. So I am prepared for that style. Is he going to bring that style? I don't know. I'll find out in the first 30 seconds, I suppose, won't I? <laughs> but um, I do genuinely believe we're well prepared for everything. I've done a 10-week camp as well rather than eight because I've had so long out. I did a 10-week extra, extra two weeks on camp. So I've been training realistically since last October, but that was more for up here and in here just to get healthy and get better and, feeling better about myself and blah, blah, blah. Mm. And then I thought, when I went down to the O2 with Dan and obviously he won the he won the world title, I thought, I'm going to have a go. Sod it. Mm. Let's have a bash. Mm. It's only a punch in the mouth that builds character, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> what are your expectations then? You've had so many boxing fights, so many glove boxing fights in, in, in various different levels and organisations and now you're coming into Bare Knuckle, completely different challenge. What is your expectations coming there on fight night? I'm expecting it to hurt a lot more. Mm. <laughs> I'm expecting to get cut and damaged a lot more than I did. Mm. Um, it's, I don't want to say fear of the unknown because that sounds like I'm uh, anxious about it and I'm not really. It's just a fight at the end of the day. But I suppose it is a fear of the unknown. It's like, well, what's it going to feel like when I get... I mean, I've spurred with MMA gloves and stuff like that, so I've had the yeah. little little punches and with Dan McGrathen as well, who can dig a bit, punching you in the mouth. Yeah. I'll get him back, I'll get him back one day. Um, <laughs> it's... Um, I've experienced it a little bit, but this is this is knuckle boxing. It's completely different, but we'll see how it goes when I get there. You, you, it's something you can't prepare for, I believe. You can't prepare for a knuckle punch in the mouth. Mm. You know, we've all been cracked when we've been at the pizza shop for being a bit gobby or whatever, you know. And we've had a few too many Bacardis and Coke, but sustained knuckle punches is going to be completely different. Mm. But it is what it is. You don't sign that contract and get scared, do you? No, no, no. You get stuck in. Definitely, definitely. And, and talking about y- your career and, and how you're going to develop into this new style of fighting, there's always that thing about hands, about cuts. You know, these yeah. are, unfortunately, the, the tools of your trade and these are the things that end fights. But have you had any recurring hand injuries, you know, cuts, anything that you, you think would, would cause you a problem on fight night? Uh, no, I've never had, never had a... I've, I've got sore hands. All boxers, I've got sore hands, achy hands from hitting the pads and hitting the bag. But I've never had any... Serious hand injuries at all, but I've had sprained fingers and stuff, but nothing, nothing that's going to be ongoing and long term problems. Um, I only ever got cut twice in my glove three times. I got cut once in sparring. I got cut twice in fights in nearly hundred fights. Wow! So I must have a um, skin of leather, <laughs> <laughs> something like that. And a chin of steel. I, I I hear regularly from Dan McGrathen. I mean, he's what ninety five kilogram guy, a huge person, and and you're in there sparring him, even when you weren't fighting anymore. You were you were training with him, and you were getting in there. Yeah, with, this is always I, I, I spar all even when I was a fifteen stone fat guy. I was still fancy a spar, John and Jim Pride. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <I> fancy <laughs> a spar. <laughs> and you were when you look around at sparring, and there is no easy rounds. You're the easy round. <laughs> it's as simple as that. <laughs> That's how it works. Have a look around the room, spurring, no easy rounds in here. You're the easy round. And 12 months ago, I was the easy round. Not so much now. No, so let's talk just before we go into sponsors and thanks and wrap things up. Ambitions. You mentioned that you didn't want to get too far ahead of yourself, but you must have. Yes something in mind what what would you like to achieve in bare knuckle boxing yeah i don't want to look past third of september because it's obviously the first time i'm getting in there in this kind of discipline this kind of combat sport but i'd like to be to maybe this fight and another one should i win them both go for the british 
and then I'm trying to, I'm trying not to I want to be a world champion and defend it. I think that defines a champion when you defend it. The likes of, you know, Lowell, Anthony Holmes, people like that, they've defended the championship, so they're regarded as genuine champions. Yeah. I'd like to be regarded as that, you know. I'd like to think, well, he won it and he stepped up and defended it. Yeah. Am I good enough? Find out. But you don't find out anything without jumping in and having a go, do you? So hopefully I'll get there. But that's 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 the dream of all fighters, I think, George, whether you're an undercard fighter boxing on a matchroom show or whether you're a burnacle fighter who's just signed his contract three weeks away from his first fight. Mm. You're um it's still your uh, still a dream, still a goal for every fighter, I believe. 100%. Personally. So finally, sponsors and thanks, people that you want to thank. Obviously, there's gonna be a lot of people that have helped you in this camp. Yes, I've got a, quite a few sponsors, so I've actually got them on the phone. I'm going to read them off. I know it comes across some professional. I do apologise. <laughs> so we've got Pen Babes. Who they got, I have got actually got the sponsor t shirt on. There we go. But I will read them all out anyway. But I know you can't see them all, so apologies for sponsors. I've got Pen Babes. I've got Tisha LBA. I've got Lengthen Court, Salt Rose Tattoo. Daniel Dickinson at Forefront Construction. We've got Kevin Hugo at Hideout. We've got Sue Hewitt, a Standish Chiropractic Clinic. We've got Sue Kennedy, who does my physio for me, SK Holistics. We've got Damien Jones at Jones and Tattoo. We've got Scott Watson at Valhalla Strength and Fitness, who's I've just been seeing this morning, actually, gives me a lot of my supplements, amino acids, creatine, stuff like that, recovery stuff. Ben Francis at OmniFit, who does my strength and conditioning for me. And with him Wednesday morning, that's not going to be pleasant. It never is. Uh, Daniel Dixon again at Clean and Sweet. Ben Fisher at DAB and TVs. Connor Corny at AC Plastering. And my final sponsor is the main sponsor. It's this one here, Hearn Group. Steve Daly at Hearn Group. Massive monetary contribution for me to through camp. Got me a nice room in the Crown Plaza on the Docklands. All paid for. Spa and everything in there. He's been... He's been gold through this camp. I can't thank him enough. He's been absolute gold because anything you need, anything you need. So he's been gold. They've all been brilliant. I appreciate all the monetary contributions and the services they provide for me. But Steve in particular, that was that was a massive help because you know yourself, George, you can't get a hotel room for 50 quid in the centre of London on a Saturday <laughs> night, can you? <laughs> so that was going to be a big expense for the weekend. So he took care of that for me. And I'm very grateful for that. Brilliant stuff. Well, listen, mate, I'm really looking forward to this one. I'm going to be there, so that's a great a great Lovely. change. Lovely stuff. Unfortunately, last show, I wasn't able to make it, so I'm looking forward to this one and looking forward to your debut, mate. So, yeah. I was working time. as well for the last show, so I couldn't make it, so. We'll be there we, together. Uh, we missed each other. We were we didn't pass in the night on that particular occasion. <laughs> exactly, mate. Thank you very much, George. Thanks for having me on. See you in a bit, bud. Cheers, dude. See you later.